In last week's lesson, we saw Jesus was in Cana, and there in Cana, he had healed the official from Capernaum's son 20 miles away. So Jesus is over in Cana. The official for Capernaum comes over and says, Hey, Jesus, my son is dying. If you'll go with me back to Capernaum, uh, I know that he will live. And Jesus just simply says, Go on back. Your son is healed. So Jesus is not even in Capernaum, and he heals his son. And sure enough, the official takes off. He goes back towards his house. On his way to his house, it's a good hard day's journey back to Capernaum. His, his uh, employees come and say, your son is healed. And he says, what time was, were they healed? And they said, about 7 o'clock last night. And the official knew that it, that was the time when Jesus had said, your son is healed. So the, the official is headed back to Capernaum, and Jesus goes to Nazareth. And from Nazareth, if you remember what happens there in Nazareth, his folks come in, his, his people, he's teaching in the temple, I mean teaching in the synagogue there, and the, the people of Nazareth goes, do for us here what you've done in Capernaum. Well, they hadn't even, he hadn't even been to Capernaum and, uh, on this trip, and he says, do for us what you've done there. They've heard about the healing. And in fact, they turn around, they say to Jesus, physician, heal thyself, and what? They mean by that is, because Jesus is not sick, they mean, Jesus, if you're the physician, heal your own people here in Nazareth. And of course, Jesus, you know, says, well, listen, you remember back in the days of Elijah and Elisha, there was three and a half years of uh, famine, and only one widow got helped and one leper got healed during that three and a half year time. And so the people of Nazareth took took it as he was, um, he was telling them no, so they went to run him off towards the edge of the cliff there in Nazareth, and he slipped them and headed on over Capernaum, so, and gets away from them, so he's, the prophecy comes true that, uh, that Jesus is not going to be accepted in his own hometown. Well, let's just back up. Jesus is baptized, this is the Jordan River, Jesus is baptized at Bethany beyond the Jordan. From there, he comes to Canaan, well, after he goes to the wilderness for 40 days, he then comes to Canaan and he turns the water into wine. From Canaan, he goes over to Capernaum, and we know nothing really about that trip to Capernaum. Then from Capernaum, he heads on back down to Jerusalem for Passover about a month later. From the Passover, is where we're picking up today, he heads back to Cana, and there's where he heals the official son. From there, he is going to head over to Capernaum. But... We don't really know that yet, and we don't know what happens there in Capernaum either. That was in last week's lesson. So from Capernaum, it's about time for the Day of Atonement to happen. So Jesus is heading back down to Jerusalem. Now, mind you, this is a good four days journey. This is a day's journey, and it's a good three days journey over to Canaan. So he is flat making tracks during this first year of his, um, of his ministry. So he is baptized in fit about 1st of February of 27 A.D. He goes down to the Passover in March, April of 27 A.D. He heals over here. He goes over here and does this. He heads on back and, 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 he, comes, and he comes down. He wants to head down here for this Day of Atonement. Let's pick up there in John chapter 5, verse 1. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews. Now that feast of the Jews is the Day of Atonement. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool which is called in Hebrew Bethesda. Don't mix that up with Bethany or uh, Bethsaida. This is the pool of uh, Bethesda which has five porticos or five porches. Oh, it's terrible when you start hitting the double nickel, isn't it? Everything starts to go. Oh, mercy. Well, anyway... I wish some more of this weight would go if you know how that is, too, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, let me tell you what's going on on the Day of Atonement. Now, folks, listen. The Day of Atonement is not something that Moses came up with or the Lord told Moses to do or the Jews just started it on, on, uh, in the wilderness after they came out. That's, the Day of Atonement is, is, a, is a feast that, and a celebration that goes a whole lot further back from that. Supposedly, back in the Garden of Eden, and we'll just kind of draw us a little picture here to talk about the Garden of Eden. You remember in the Garden of Eden, there was one rule that dealt with one tree. Remember that? You can eat of everything, Adam and Eve, except for the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, lo and behold, one day, probably about a hundred years into them being there in the Garden of Eden, they don't even have kids yet, 
Um, they go and they pick this fruit off of it. And you remember how the serpent came and had that little conversation with, with Eve. And then she took it to Adam and they bit of it. And lo and behold, they go over to the bush. And they go over in these bushes. And the Lord comes and says, Adam and Eve, where are you? And they're sticking their head out from behind the bush because they have, they're hiding themselves. And besides that, they've taken a bunch of fig leaves and strung them together and put them on. They said, well, we're hiding ourselves. Why are you hiding yourselves? Because we're naked. Who told you you were naked? And they, have you ever felt a fig leaf? Bad, yeah, bad news. Fig leaves are not something you want to just cozy up to if you know. Well, the Lord says that will never do. And, and the tradition that has always been passed down is that on what we would call... Uh, the tenth of Tishri, or the Day of Atonement, it usually falls about the tenth of October, around there, pretty close within two or three days. That the Lord took and He killed an animal, and He took the hides from the animal, and He covered their bodies with clothing, and that's when the clothing started. Uh, I wish the Day of Atonement would show up with some of the people that I see walking around today and on TV. They need some clothing to cover them too. But anyway, traditionally on the Day, the day of Atonement was a feast to remember the day that Jesus covered their sin, their bodies, and their sin with clothing. That's the Day of Atonement, in which blood was shed for the very first time. You catch that? Blood was shed for the first time to cover the sins. They had one single thing they were not supposed to do in the Garden of Eden. Just one thing, and they couldn't keep it. So that was the Day of Atonement, and that's where that comes from. So he is going down to Jerusalem for the Day of Atonement, and he goes in through the Sheep Gate. Okay. The temple faced east, and the temple ground faced east with, the, with uh, everything around it. And when you came into the east, northeastern side, there was a gate there where all of the offerings of sheep and other animal would come through this because this is really the sheep, they call it the sheep gate, but when you're going through this, this is not good for you if you're a sheep because that means you are headed to be an offering or food or something when you come through this gate. And they were all gathered off to the side. Now, your responsibility as a Jew in that day, you were to go look at your flock and you were to select the 10% of the flock that was absolutely the best, the spotless, pure lamb or sheep or, or goat or whatever you're bringing. All the offerings came through this gate. If you would select the best of the olive oil that you have, the best of the wheat, the best of the wine, everything came through the sheep gate to be offered to the temple. So you would give a 10%, and that was what you were to give, <clears throat> of what you had uh, gathered that year. And you brought it into the temple, and it was placed into different type of holding pens or vats or whatever as the offerings came in. <clears throat> so in might come a hundred sheep. They were come to, to being offered to the temple for the purpose of your offering, or your sacrifice for, the, um, uh, for your sins and for whatever that's going on in your life and whatever was whatever time it was for the intaking of the harvest. Uh, this is interesting <clears throat> because most people don't understand what I'm fixing to say to you. In fact, the work of the church and the work of the temple has always been exactly the same. Once everything was gathered in, the responsibility of the person um, who gave it is over with. Once you give it, you have they had no control over what happened to it. Okay. You might think you had the very best lamb that has ever been born and you're giving it and it's the prized lamb and it's the one that ought to be sacrificed on the altar for the Day of Atonement. But once it gets into the temple, it's not your responsibility anymore. What happened in there, then the priests come along and they select the best 10% of the, what has been given. So you've got a hundred sheep in here, and they're going to select the best ten of them, and your sheep may not get, get, get picked. What happens to your sheep, the other 90%? Well, I'll remind you that there's a tribe called the tribe of Levi who they are not uh, allowed to own property or fields or any way to earn money because that every boy that is born is a, into the tribe of Levi is to be a priest. And so he gets married and he has children and they're growing up and they've got to feed the family someplace. The Lord provided for this. 
the other 90 sheep that are not selected from the 100 are given to the family. That 90% goes out and is distributed among all the priests in the area, either around the temple, or around the synagogues, so that they can live. And only 10% of what is given into the temple is then actually offered on the sacrifice. That food, that, those sacrifices feed the priests and the ministers who are ministering in the temple at that time during that day. And of course, they had lots of food and they could take it back to their families too uh, whenever they were, had leftovers and that type of things. They were left over. They took and they fed. So the whole system works exactly the same way. When you bring your tithes and offerings to the church, when you bring them and you put them in the pot, don't be guilty of this. When you give it, it's gone. It's not yours anymore to say, I gave that $20 and I'm not happy how you spent that $20 on a new broom because we have 15 brooms in every closet around this house, this church. It's not your responsibility. So what happens is, is they, they bring that in, and that's what the, the gate is all about, where everything comes through to offer. And that wasn't part of your lesson. That was just extra. I thought it would be a good place for us to throw it in. Because then the church comes along. We do the same thing. Your offerings come in. That's what pays our salaries. How do you think that ministers live? We have to be paid salaries. And it's just like here, where 90% of what you got goes out to the other type of stuff. I'm not sure if that's how our budget is. In fact, it's not. We actually, we actually try to keep our salaries at 50% of the offerings or less. In fact, you know that any, any corporation that tries to operate with a payroll over 50% of what your income is is doomed. Just doomed because you cannot pay your taxes and your unemployment taxes and your overhead and your lights and your bills if your salaries are over 50%. So that's, that's what we hold here. You'll never see our salaries at Sagemont Church over 50% because we got other things to pay for. We got, we got, the great part about it is, is they did not have an electricity bill in the temple. <clears throat> they, they used solar power if you really got it. They were green if you want to put it that way. Well, there's that pool, <clears throat> Bethsaida, that is there and, and uh, with the five porches that are around it. Verse 3. In these lay, talk about these porches, a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered. Now, folks, the rest of that passage that is marked through is in brackets. Now, the New American Standard in every Bible does it differently. The um, New American Standard, the NIV, the King James, read your preface of the Bible, and it tells you how it handles difficult passages like this. When it is in brackets in the New American Standard, that means that it has been added to the text by someone after 400 A.D., and it also means that you cannot find that thought anywhere else in the Bible. If it's in parentheses, according to the New American Standard, that means that it has been added after A.D. 400, but that thought is someplace else in the Bible. So there's, that thought is there, and it can be brought over. Or if it's in italics, it means that it's not there at all either. Until And, and the word, when it's in italics, it usually means that we have added those words so it makes the English understandable to us. The truth of the matter is, is if you see a word in italics, drop it out because it, those words in italics usually confuse. It is somebody's opinion on what they're saying. Uh, and we're going to get to a couple of those uh, in this lesson, and I'll point them out to you. Well, but the truth of the matter is, is in our history books, what is said here uh, in italic, in, in the brackets that I've marked out because it's not in the oldest and most original, was the belief of the day about this pool. They believed that when the waters begin to stir, it was the act of the angels and God. And if you could get, if you were sick, if you could get into those waters first, that you would be healed. Now, evidently, somewhere in the past, uh, people don't start doing these things just by hearsay. Something happened. It probably got, in their superstition, got blown out of proportion. But something happened one time at, the, at that pool that caused these people to go and to lay there underneath these porches and to gather there waiting to be healed by these waters. We do not have any notion. We do not have any record of anyone ever being healed at this pool, but for some reason, they thought that that happened. We have that happen all the time. You know, we really do. I know that there's, there are times, for instance, 
You know, you'll look at a wall and you'll think you'll see the picture of Jesus in the wall. And the next thing you know, because it's just dirt on the wall. And the next thing you know, it's on the internet. And people are going to stand out in lines to look at the picture of Jesus that has miraculously occurred on the wall. Folks, I thought I saw Jesus one time on our doggy door. You know where the dog goes out and the dog comes back and the doggy goes out? Where his ears hit and all It just formed a perfect picture of Jesus as his snout went down and all that. It's dirt. Windex took it right away. In fact, if it's Jesus, you can't wipe it away with Windex. You know that? If it's divine, it can't happen. Well, these things happen. This is exactly what the idea of happens with this pool. If the waters start to move and you can get down there first, you'll be healed. So that's what's happening. Jesus goes by that. As we pick up in verse 5, a man was there who had been ill for 38 years. 38 years. It doesn't mean the man is 38 years old. He's been ill for 38 years. Now, I can, I can attest to that. My grandmother was born in 1885, and whenever she got, she, at age 32, she got sick. And they called in the family. She lived in Mundy, Texas. They called in the fa family from Haskell and from Rule and from Abilene and Knox City and Boat Cheetah, Oklahoma. I mean, they were coming on in, and for a couple of weeks, they stood around her bed thinking she was going to die at age 32. She outlived everybody standing around her bed except for her, two of her children. That Only two of her children did not die before she did, and she died, I think, at 96 or 98. She outlived them. We don't, and of course, back, if you add that up, 32 on top of uh, 1885 when she was born, we didn't have medicines back then. We didn't know what was going on, you know. She had eaten a bad batch of beans that she had fixed and leftovers, and that's what was going on. She had food poisoning, and they didn't quite know what it was. Well, she was sick. In fact, by, she, she was always sick after that. She didn't take medicine by the pill. She took it by the pound of pills. In fact, there were lots of times I'd have to drive my little old bicycle, that, ride my bicycle down, go, and if I'm coming home from school, go by the pharmacy and pick up medicine for her. I mean, she literally had two boot boxes full of pills. Now, by the time I realized what was going on, I thought it was really funny. She never took the medicine according to what was on the bottle. She would pick up the bottle, shake it. If it has a pill, she's got to take one, you know. Shake, shake. Take a pill. She was sick for all of her life after she was 32. Sixty-something years she was sick, thinking she was going to die. She outlived them all. Well, this man had been sick for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, by the way, see the uh, italic words? That's not in the oldest and most original. It's just there, there to, uh, as a, uh, English people have put this in to help us understand in English. It had already been a long time. He said to him, do you wish to get well? <laughs> Look what the man says. Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, oh, come on, get up. Pick up your pallet and walk. And immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Now it was a Sabbath on that day. This is the only passage of Scripture where there's no belief going on where Jesus heals. It's the only place in Jesus' ministry where we did not ask him if you believe, if, if, some, if the father believes, if the mother believes, or whatever, or someone can be healed. He just says, get on up, get up, go take up your pallet. The man gets up, rolls up his pallet, and starts walking. Bad news if you're in Jewish land. Look what happens, verse 10. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, it is the Sabbath, and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. Can you imagine? You, you can't carry your pallet on the Sabbath. Now, as we will find out later, you know, it's okay for if your donkey gets into the well for you to, on the Sabbath to go hook him up with a rope and pull him out. That's not considered work. For you and me, that would have been a whole lot more work than carrying a pallet. All right, you follow me? But they set up these rules and regulations. They, make the, they made this mechanical code of life of things you could do and things you could not do on the Sabbath. I mean, in fact, they were so restrictive. On Monday you had to fast. On Thursday you had to fast. On the Sabbath, uh, on Saturday came along these things where you couldn't do anything after 6 o'clock. You had to have all it prepared and ready. 
Uh, you couldn't walk over so many, oh, so many distance, and they even kept changing that, if you remember in the lesson we had over in Mark, where they couldn't even make up their mind of how, how far a Sabbath day's journey was. And so they kept extending it so you could go further and further. And, and with these little tricks that you would do, folks, salvation is not tied up in tricks. Salvation is not tied up in a way that you can manipulate how God operates and how God works. Salvation is tied up in what you believe in God and believe in the Father. Well, he says, pick up your bed. And he answered, and he said, he who made me well is the one who said to me, pick up your pallet and walk. <laughs> in other words, hey, I didn't do this. It wasn't my fault. I mean, I was just laying there by the pool and underneath one of the porches. And Jesus, that man came along and says, pick up your pallet and walk. And I did, and I was healed, and I'm cured. Hey, it's not my fault. He's the one who told me. Nanny, nanny, boo, boo. It's not my fault. You can't do anything to me, Pharisees. So they ask him, who is this man who said to you, pick up your pallet and walk? But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away uh, while there uh, was a crowd in that place. I don't know who he was. I mean, he just came along and healed me and told me to get up and take up my pallet, and I walked. I don't know who he is. I, I have no idea. I mean, I don't see him around here. I'm sorry. I mean, I wish I could help you more. Oh, gee, you know, I'm sorry. I wish I could help you, but I can't. They're upset. Who told you to pick up your pallet? You have broke the law, the Sabbath law. Well, they're already inside where the pool is. They're around this area just by the uh, sheep's gate. Jesus has already gone over the temple area. He's been there seven months before when he cleaned it out and nobody said anything to him. Do you remember that? So he's over there and lo and behold, he sees the man that he healed. And Jesus goes up to him and he says, Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so nothing worse happens to you. <laughs> and what does the man do? The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. There he is right there. See, 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 see. I told you. That's him. That's him. He's the one that did it. I'm not guilty of carrying my pallet because he told me to. He's the one to blame. So the Jews go over there and they are furious with Jesus. Look here. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. How dare you, Jesus of Nazareth, Tell someone to break the law, to pick up his pallet and walk. How dare you? You not only, you sin by that, and you cause the man to sin because of it. But he answered, he said, My father is working until now. Working until now. Catch that picture. He's been working all the way through this. In everything that has happened in this world, he has been working until now. This, that means everything in the past is happening because of what the Father is doing. And I myself am working. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but look what else he was doing. Also was calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. Jesus has been baptized. It is now... Um, uh, um, it is now October of, of 27 A.D. Um, Jesus has been, it's only been seven months since Jesus has been baptized. He's already told them, his uh, followers, once about uh, that he's going to be killed. And now we've already seven months into his ministry. We have the Jews wanting him killed because he's teaching on the Sabbath. But worse than that is he's blasphemed. He is claiming to have a personal relationship with the Father and that he is equal with the Father. That's blasphemy. Nobody has a relationship with the Father as a Jew. You do not have a relationship. They do not have a relationship. It is a hurdle jumping uh, faith where you have to jump this hurdle, her next hurdle, the next hurdle in order to please the Father. That's no different than Islam. That's no different than Hindu. That's no different than uh, Buddhism. That's no different than Mormonism. That's no different than Jehovah's Witnesses. That's no different than some of our Christian faith where you have ministers who come out and their entire ministry is preaching about 10 things to do and 10 things not to do. 
So they read you one verse, and out of that one verse, they tell you ten things to do and ten things not to do, and I'm stepping on people's toes now. I know that right now. Because I can sure I can open fo uh, most of y'all's Bible if you take notes and look in your Bible, and you've got somewhere written there, ten things to do, ten things not to do, nine things this, ten things this, seven things to be happy with this, and everybody is coming, and you're, you're coming to find out how to get along in life today and tomorrow with some little touchy-feely thing that the preacher says, and all he's done is read a verse, proof text what he wants to tell you, and probably if you read the rest of the text, what he's told you doesn't even fit the text, the whole story. He's just pulled it out of context as a pretext for what he wants to tell you about the text. Folks, when one of the greatest churches in the world has the prince of preachers at this point in time, the prince of preacher dies, and within two years the church is falling apart. A church that would have 9,000 people in an 8 o'clock worship service in this country so that at the 11 o'clock worship service they could have room for the visitors that would come, and within two years they don't even have 500 attending on a grand day of ingathering where they usually took up millions of dollars for missions. They didn't have it. The people boycotted the church. If he was a prince of preachers and he was teaching the word of God instead of alliterating everything for the power of this and the prosperity of this and the providence of that, instead of writing those things down, we should have been writing down the heart of God out of the scriptures. I better go on before I get in trouble. Well, here he goes on. He goes, he says, that man, he says, listen, Verse 17, but he answered and said, My father is working now until now, and I myself am working for this reason. Therefore, Jews who are seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but he was also calling himself in a relationship with his father, but making himself equal with God. Verse 19, therefore, Jesus answered and was saying to them, Jesus is going to have a good talk with them there in this temple area. Verse 19, truly, truly, that means amen, amen. I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. In other words, I'm only doing with the man at the pool what the Father wanted done. I do what the Father wants done, and that is what I do. I don't do anything the Father doesn't want done. We are equal. They are upset. He is pouring it on. He is just really coming down hard on them. And the Jews cannot stand it because they do not have a relationship with the Father. None of those false religions have a relationship with the Father. In fact, the only way to have a relationship with the Father is to have a relationship with the Son first. So in verse 20 he says, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing, and the Father will show him greater works than these, so that you will marvel. In other words, the Father's got bigger plans that the Son is, he says, I'm the Son and I'm going to do these so that you'll marvel at what's going to happen. You're going to see great things. You see, the Jews had taken the Old Testament words that were written down by Moses and the rest of the prophets and, and, the, uh, um, and Ezra, and they all put them in the Scripture. They looked at that stuff, and they begin writing their own mechanical code. And their code look, ends up looking like nothing like that of the Scripture because they kept changing it, changing it. And we know how that is. We, uh, it's like gossip. You take the truth and you tell it to one person that just got changed somehow. And by the time that person tells it to the next person, it got changed. And then by the time you go down through the room, you get to the end, it doesn't look anything like it did to begin with. But everybody else in between the room believes it. But they all believe something a little different because they all heard a little different. And it got, kept getting changed all the way down. That's what's happened with the Jewish faith. By the time that Jesus comes, they've had 400 years of silence where they haven't heard a word from the Lord spoken audibly at all through a prophet. And now they've changed it to where they don't even recognize the words of Moses. Verse 21, for just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, by the way, that is physical death and physical life. We don't see it in the English because it's just life and death. But if we were Greek and we were listening to these words being spoken, we would tell the difference because here he's using the word zoos, Z-O-O-S. He's saying, look, here's the physical death, uh, physical life is Zeus. He say, and, and talk about physical death, even so the Son also gives physical life there to whom he wishes. 
Now, Jesus has not raised anyone from the dead yet. Elisha and Elijah have. In fact, both of them raised people from the dead. In fact, the body of Elisha was thrown into a grave after, it, after he died, and the dead man who was already in the grave too came to life, if you remember, from Elisha's dead body hitting it. So physical life is what he's talking about there. But Jesus has not raised anyone from the dead yet. He will soon with Jairus' daughter. He will with the, the son, of the daughter of the widow from Nans. He will with Lazarus pretty soon, but not quite yet. For not even the Father judges anyone, but He has given all judgment to the Son. Man, Jesus is flat blaspheming now. He is telling these Jews that every bit of authority has been given from the Father to Him, and He is going to exercise it, so that all will honor the Son. The word honor there really means to uh, carries along the idea of worship. Just as you worship the Father and what you do, you also to worship the Son, that's blasphemy. Even as they honor the Father, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. You can't honor the Father unless you honor me, Jesus is saying. Can you believe these Jews have just not got it yet? Now, Jesus changes his words in the next passage. Truly, truly, or amen, amen, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me, believes the Father who sent me, has eternal, the word is not Zeus, the word is Zoe. It's spiritual life. So he's gone from talking about physical life to spiritual life. So if you want to have spiritual life, you have to believe me and the one who sent me and does not come into judgment, but has passed out, out of Death has passed out of physical death, by the way, into spiritual life. We don't see that because we don't speak Greek. But they knew exactly what was going on. So truly, truly, he says, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is. Whoa, an hour is coming and now is means it's happening right now. Remember the last time when he's talking about what happened, God the Father had been working all, and he had been working all this time up till now. He says, now there's going to be an hour, there's a time coming, and that time is right now. In a few minutes he can say there's a time that's going to be coming, and that means it's going to happen in the future. So he's telling us timing. Things have happened in the past, things are happening right now, and in just a minute he's going to say things are going to happen in the future. They're going to happen after these things have happened. He says, there's a time is coming and it is now when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. When the physically dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. That means those who are walking around, but truly they are dead. They are dead in their trespasses. And did I say physically dead? I meant spiritually dead. Those who are spiritually dead will hear the voice of God and turn from their sins. We don't get it in the English because it's in the Greek, and we don't, it's not translated well for us. It's a, it's a poor translation. The spiritually dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will have spiritual life, or spiritually live. For just as the Father has life in Himself, even so He gave to the Son also to have spiritual life in Himself, and He gave Him authority to execute judgment, because He is the Son of Man. We've already talked about the Son of Man. We've already defined that because it's already been brought up. He's the God who has come to be as man, but also as God to rule over the world. Mm, mm, mm. Verse 28. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming. There it is. It's going to come in the future. In which all who are in the tombs will hear His voice. That means all those who are physically dead will also hear His voice. Now, right now, it's the spiritually dead will hear their voice and live. But there's going to come a time when those who have already experienced physical death will hear His voice too. We know that happens in Matthew chapter 27, verse 52 and 53 is the reference point. Go read it. When Jesus is resurrected from the tombs, all the Old Testament saints who have already died and gone on are resurrected also, walking around where the people in the city see them walking around the streets. Listen, if I saw Grandma Ismail or whatever her name was, Ismela, walking around, and I knew she'd been dead for 15 years, I believe I would become a believer really fast, wouldn't you? If I saw Daniel or Hosea, Amos, Amos or Obadiah or Hezekiah, or 
Jeremiah or any of those other ayahs that are out there that are coming and, and walking around the streets of the saints of old and David and remember, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, that's right, or, or specifically Daniel. Daniel, he, he's all worried about when all the prophecy that he has, uh, has that the Lord has told him to write down and he's written down and told everyone, he says, when's all this going to happen? And the Lord says, Daniel, don't worry about that. Chapter 12, don't worry about that. You're going to not have to go through this. and not even, You're going to get raised at the end of this age, not at the end of that age that we're talking about. You're going to get, at the, and there he is. When Jesus is resurrected, Jesus has gone down to the bosom of Abraham, to the Sabbath rest, to the place of peaceful rest. And there he, he wakes Samuel and everybody up. And he talks to them, and he goes to the edge of the cavern, the great gulf that's between the bosom of Abraham, and he speaks across that gulf to those people who are in torment, who have rejected the Messiah and the coming of the Messiah all through the ages. And they're over there, and they're just, they're in what Jim Finley calls preheat. Because one day they're going to get a resurrected body and they're going to come and they're going to stand and they're going to find out that they're not going to heaven and they're going to the lake of fire where there'll be burning and gnashing of teeth and pain and agony in a resurrected body that is there for them to suffer for all eternity in. Well, it says there's an hour is coming in which those who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did the good, take out the word deeds because that's in italics. Those who did the good to a resurrection of life, and those who committed evil to a resurrection of judgment. If you put in the word deeds, you think it's works. That word deeds should not be there. It's not even intended to be there, and why the editors put it in. What is the good? If you do good, that means you've accepted the Messiah, and the coming of the Messiah, or Jesus as the Messiah, or Jesus as your Lord, you have done good because you have put your faith and trust in the good news, the gospel. In other words, now if you, re you refuse to do that, then you have, you have turned your back and away from the, the Lord. That is evil. Folks, that's all that matters in this world. You can be the most sinful person in the world, and if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, on your deathbed, you've done the good. Or, on the, on the or even on the cross, as, that's right, Jim, as, as one of the... One of the uh, thieves did on the cross, whether you're baptized or not, you've done the good. But if you die without doing that, you've done the evil. That's the only thing that matters. It's the difference between us and every other false religion or false faith. That's the difference. Well, Jesus has the ability, and by the way, it's two resurrections. Now, he puts it here and he separates it. Who does good to a resurrection of life, who commits evil, a resurrection of the judgment. Two different directions. Two different resurrections. Not one resurrection at the same time, but two different. Now we found that out when we studied through Paul's writings and also the writings of John over in the Revelation. We find out what those two different resurrections are. We'll cover it now. We've already covered it before. But it's two separate resurrections. Jesus goes on to say as he's talking, I can do nothing on my own initiative. Here he is back at that same theme again. It's well, I'm doing what the Father wants done because I know the will of the Father. I, as I hear, I judge. I don't do what I want to do. As I hear the Father, then I do the judgment. I do what the Father makes the plan. You see, the Father makes the plan. Jesus creates the plan. Holy Spirit sustains the plan. They all work in unison together. They do not work apart. They do not have a thought that is different. They do not have one plan. They do not argue on the committee. They're in unison. They are one God who presents himself to us in three persons. He says, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Well, who can know the will of God? Some of us worry about the will of God. and We can't know the perfect will of God, but Jesus could because he was God. He knew what the Father's will was. I'm often amazed at the people who come and sit before me. They're looking for the will of God in their life. And so many times I'll say to them, what do you think you should do in this situation? In fact, that's my standard, my standard question. And they will tell me, I think this is what I need to do. And I'm sitting back, that's what I thought you needed to do. I think that's where you need to go. You see, the problem is, is God speak to us, speaks to us through the Holy Spirit who indwells us and lives within us. And for some reason, we fight it. 
we fight it. We're not willing to accept the Holy Spirit talking to us in our heart, lighting up and enlightening our heart of what we should do and what we should not do. And we know better. Well, most of us, by the time we're our age, we've lived through this enough that we've we ought to know better, but we don't. We don't. We still make the same mistakes over and over. We, and when it's over with, we go, I knew I shouldn't have done that. I knew there was just something not right about that. Just something not right. It's, it's like, it's the example where I talk about going up to a door. And you say, okay, is it God's will for me to go through this door? And you walk up and you grab the door handle and you turn it and lo and behold, it opens. And you step through. It's just as easy as pie. I don't know why I say that. Why easy as pie? How, how easy is pie? Oh, well, anyway. Then there's a door right here. And you reach over to grab it. Well, it's locked. Well, it's got to be God's will for me to go through this door because I just went through this door. Now you get all that human nature going inside of you. You know, I know this is God's will. So you reach back and you kick the door open and you walk right through it. Only to, after a little while inside that door, you're coming back through that door going, what in the world just happened? That could not have been God's will. And you're standing there between the door that opened okay and the door that didn't open okay. And look right down there. There was another door. And it's already standing open. You were supposed to come in this door, make a turn, and go down. No, no. In your own will, you decided this was it. So you just reached back and kicked it open. Then you had to come back and finally go back through the right door. You follow me? When you walk through each door in the Lord, then you back up and you say, okay, Lord, where am I supposed to go again? If the door is locked, it's locked for a reason. It's not unlocked. I mean, it's not locked for a reason to make you have to work to get it open. When you're in God's will, they open, folks. They fall open. That's just the way it is. How do you know God's will? He makes the crooked paths straight even though it may be down around the corner because the will is open. I can do nothing on my own initiative, he says. I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. Jesus says, if I just testify about myself, my testimony is not true. Why? Because he's going to also have the testimony of the Father and the Holy Spirit because he's got that going on. There is, anything who te uh, there is another who testifies of me, and I know that testimony which he gives about me is true. He's talking about John the Baptist. I know John the Baptist's testimony is true about me, but anyway, he says, you have sent to John, and he has testified to, to the truth. And that fact, the Pharisees had gone to ask Jesus about, uh, uh, about him by this time. But the testimony which I receive is not from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. I'm telling you, I've got the Father's testimony upon me so you can be saved. And that's the reason why. Talking about John the Baptist, verse 35, he goes on to say, He was the lamp that was burning and was shining, and you were willing to rejoice for a little while in his light. John got the attention of the folks there in uh, wherever he was baptizing. He, this, this, if there's a pool of water deep enough, he's out there baptizing and every single Tom, Dick, and Harry, everybody out of every... I don't think those are Jewish names, are they? And I can't even say Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because those are Babylonian names. Hanani, Meshach, and... Who was the... What's the other name? I just went... It, it's, it's, it's Splenda again. <laughs> Hanani, Mish, Meshach, and... Yeah, that other one. That's right. Those are the Hebrew names. There, every one of those Jews folks and everybody from every city is going out to watch John the Baptist and he's the local freak show and they're loving it. This is the best thing that's hitting the screen in their day and time for moving pictures. They're out there, they're watching him and they're excited and they're listening and some of them don't agree with him but a lot of them are following him and he's a light that is shining. He's a lamp shining and pointing everyone to the Messiah that's going to come. That was his message. He only did that for about a year and a month. About a year and a month is all he ministered. But in fact, by the time of a year and a month, he's already in prison. We, that was in last week's lesson. He's been put in prison by Herod Antipas. And so uh, he's a lamp that's shining. By the way, you should be a lamp that is shining also, pointing people to Jesus. And the testimony of John is true. He says, but the testimony, verse 36, which I re have received is greater than the testimony of John for the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me. 
that the Father has sent me. He says, everything I do, including healing that man at that pool, was to testify to you that the Father has sent me because you don't have anybody else can do what I just did. His Father is, wants this done, and that, he wanted that man healed. And so I did it. For him to pick up his pallet on the Sabbath, that's all right with the God the Father too. Well, verse 37. Jesus is just pouring it on. And since he's pouring it on, he might as well make it worse. And the Father who sent me, he has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at this time or seen his form. In other words, you don't know about God the Father and you've never heard it and you've never seen God. God the Father doesn't show himself because he's a spirit, by the way. Verse 38, you do not have the word abiding in you for you do not believe him who sent me. Boy! Is he nailing, nailing them? You Jews don't even believe in the Father. So you don't believe in me. You don't have the word of the Father in you. No, they don't because they have laid down their Tanakh many, many years before and they're just dealings with, dealing with their writings and their commentary on the Tanakh which goes down several generations. Verse 39, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. Spiritual life he's talking about there. You search the scriptures, think of that. You can find this hurdle to jump. But they're not searching the Tanakh scriptures. They're searching their Mishnah. They're searching their, their um, commentaries and their writings from their rabbis. Every single Sabbath, they would get in and they'd read one passage, a little verse from the Tanakh, and then they'd read more from the rabbis instead of reading from the Word of God what they need to hear. It is these that testify about me, and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have that spiritual life. You're not even watching. You're not even listening to what Moses wrote down in Ezra and Nehemiah and all those folks. You don't write down what the Word of God, you don't read what the Word of God says because you've got your own mechanical code going on. I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, that you have not you do not have the love of God in yourself. Boy, that's strong. I have come to in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another, and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Other people come through, they have this claim of word, this rabbi has this new uh, insight into the word of God, and you believe him and you receive him, but his may not be true. But how come whenever God himself comes to speak to you, you do not accept him? And because you do not accept God himself who's coming to speak to you, you do not have a relationship with the Father who created it all, who planned it all, who sustains it all. You accept everybody else, but you don't accept God himself. The Jews have no excuse. For 1,000 years, from 1445 B.C., when they left and out of Egypt and went into the wilderness, until 404 B.C., when Malachi wrote the last word the Lord had told him to write, for that 1,000-year period of time, man was without excuse because everything God wanted them to know of the, in the Jewish faith was written down so that they could know the Father. They didn't listen to it. Didn't want it. They were without excuse. Verse 45. Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. He backs up. Hey, I don't have to accuse you. I'm the Son of God, but I don't have to accuse you. I don't have to. Why? Look on. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. If you just go back and you just read everything that Moses wrote in the first five books of the Old Testament, he has already accused the Jews. And in fact, in those books, the Lord said through Moses, when you do this, I'm going to do this. When you do this, Jewish my Israel, I'm going to do this. When you commit this act, I'm going to treat you like this. Jesus is not making, I mean, the Lord is not making a wish list for if it, just in case you do something, this is how I'm going to act to, against you. No, he is prophesying every single thing they are going to do, and when they do it, they're going to receive the judgment of the Lord upon them through the handwriting of Moses, just as it is promised. It's a prophecy. It's not a rules and regulation. It's just what he's going to do. By the way, if you go through those in Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, every time he says, when you do this, I'm going to do this. You can go look up in the rest of the Old Testament and find out where they did it, and he fulfilled it. He did it exactly like he said he was. 
verse 46 says, For if you believe Moses, you, you would believe me, he who wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? How do you believe? You don't even believe his writings. In Deuteronomy 18, 18 and 19, Moses wrote down these words from the, from the Lord. The Lord says, I will raise up a prophet from among the, their countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I commanded him. And it shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require of him. Peter and Stephen quote this verse to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. This is the verse that, John, that Jesus is talking about specifically here, and we will see it again later when Jesus uses it again to prove that he is the one, the prophet, that Moses is writing about from the words of the Lord. Hmm. Well, it's almost time for the Day of Atonement. All this has happened when Jesus is traveling down to the Day of Atonement. He's simply gone through the gate. He's in the temple area. He's talking in the temple area. All this has transpired before the Day of Atonement has actually happened. So the Day of Atonement ends, and Jesus heads on back towards Galilee. John does not tell us 36 events that Matthew, Mark, and Luke do tell us about that happen between now and this verse and John's next verse. John does not tell us about the disciples going through the grain fields and picking out grain on the Sabbath. He does not tell us about the man's hand that is healed on the Sabbath. He does not talk about Jesus withdrawing to the sea or Jesus uh, uh, being followed so that he will so that the many, the many of them can be healed. Jesus is not, John does not tell us about Jesus going up to the mountain to pray or selecting his 12 apostles. We've now got the 12 apostles in the story. It happens between these two verses in John. Jesus descends from, from the mountain and heals the multitude, and he ascends up on the mountain to preach again so they can all can hear him. He gives his great sermon on the mount. He heals the centurion's servant. The widow of Nan's son is raised from the dead. That's the one they're carrying in a, in a funeral procession. And he's been dead for a couple of days. And they, or a day, and they, Jesus raises him from the dead in the funeral procession. The second of John's uh, disciples questioned Jesus. Uh, it, uh, John has sent him to say, are you the true Messiah? John the Baptist has. Are you the one we've been looking for? Jesus commends John the Baptist. Jesus rebukes three cities. He eats with Simon the Pharisee. Mary Magdalene is finally introduced. Jesus healed the demon-possessed man. Jesus rebukes the Pharisees. Jesus speaks of the sign of Jonah. Uh, he, he, his family come to try to get him and seek him because they think he is Looney Tunes and they want to get him out of there and get him some help. Jesus tells the parables, parables by the sea. The parables are finally explained in private. Jesus' disciples are ordered to cross over to the sea. And Jesus in the bottom of that boat comes out and calms the storms when the storms come up. The legion is cast out of the violent man, the demon-possessed man. Jesus then sails over to Capernaum. Jairus asks Jesus to come heal his daughter. The woman touches the hem of his garment, and she is healed. The death of the daughter of Jairus is reported, and Jesus finally raises Jairus' daughter from the dead. And then he goes over and he heals two blind men. He then heals a mute uh, de demoniac. And he is rejected the second time. He goes over to Nazareth, and his hometown of Nazareth rejects him again. The 12 apostles are finally sent out to preach for several days. He's given, they've given the authority to do everything that Jesus does. They've given him the authority, and, he, and they go out. Finally, John the Baptist is put to death, and it's reported to Jesus. And Herod feels when he fears when he hears about Jesus that John the Baptist has been risen from the dead. With that, all in between, taking up, finally, finally, uh, John picks up back with the story. Look at this. He goes from, For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe in me? To this verse. After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Those things did not happen at Galilee. Those things happened down in Jerusalem. He has gone to Jerusalem, and finally he turns around, He's gone to Jerusalem, and he is coming back to Galilee, and he comes back up from Jerusalem after the Day of Atonement, and he's at Tiberias. Tiberias, 22 A.D., Herod uh, Antipas builds 
uh, his chief city there on the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee. Because he calls that Tiberias, they call this portion of the sea the Sea of Tiberias. But this is Genesaret, Genesaret. And also, Luke tells us that part of the sea is also called the Sea of Genesaret. And Capernaum is right up here. But it's all a part of the Sea of Galilee. So we know exactly where they are. After these things, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. It just simply means he's going to this part in Tiberias. Later on, John does tell us it's Tiberias. A large crowd followed him. In fact, the crowd is humongous, absolutely huge by this time because the, of the signs that which he had, was performing on those who were sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. So we've got a time again. We're at the Passover time of A.D. 28. It's been a year and three months since he was baptized. And so here we are. So the, all four Gospels tell this story about what happens on the hillside, right, the mountainside, right here at Tiberias. Therefore, Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test him, for he, he himself knew what he was intending to do. Jesus already had the plan. He knew they didn't have enough money, but he's saying out loud to Philip, so Philip will say something to him. And Philip goes on and he says, Look, we, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient uh, for them, for everyone to even receive a little. A denarius was one coin of silver, about not very three-tenths of an ounce of something of silver. Well, that was equal to one day's wage. And one day's wage would feed a family, a man, his wife, and four or five or six kids for one day, a family. Philip is telling us they only have 200 denarii in the bag. And that's not enough money. That'll feed about 200 families. But they've got a problem. They've got a whole lot more families than that that are here. Looking on. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, Now there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they with so many? Actually, we found over in Mark, they had been listening to him on this mountainside for three days. They all had their own food, but their food had run out. And now Jesus is not interested in their spiritual needs. He's interested in their physical needs because he sees them. And it's, there's not enough food in Tiberias. There's not, not, not enough food in the towns around to find enough bread for them. And there's this little boy who's got five loaves and two fishes. There was a, and it goes on, Jesus said to them, verse 10, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down. In, in number about 5,000. So, get this. 200 denarius would feed about 200 men with their families. There's 5,000 men here with their families. That means they would have to have 5,000 denarii in order to buy enough food if they could find enough food. So he sets them down. Jesus took the loaves of bread and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated, likewise also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were all filled, he said to the disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. They filled five basketfuls of bread. Can you imagine? One basket for each of the twelve apostles. One. It was a miracle. Unbelievable miracle. Now the next passage is going to say that he crossed across, had them cross across the sea. And in our minds, we'd think they'd be going this way. But they're not. They're actually going to Capernaum. So he's going to have them go up. It's about a four-mile little trip up here to go to the edge of the water. Then it's about four miles into Capernaum. So they're going to head that way. And they're going to have these baskets. And these apostles are not ceremonially clean. And so when they land at Capernaum, there are the Pharisees who are waiting for them. And they're saying, we've seen you eating. They're eating out of those baskets of food. And you're not clean. You can't eat before you wash and clean, right? We didn't even water to wash. And you stuck your grubby little old hands in those, five, in those 12 baskets. And you were eating in those boats as you were coming back over. How dare you do that? And for the rest of that story, I'll see you next week. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. And we thank you that you gave uh, to John even 60 years after every other uh, Gospels have been written to tell about your Galilean ministry, you gave the authority to John to write down the rest of the ministry of the Judean, Judean ministry so that we would know how you operate and that you are God. 
and, that, and all the, the conversations that took place with all the Jewish leadership and the Pharisees. We thank you for that. We thank you that you're a God who came to create this world, but then you were willing to come and to be the Savior of the world. And I thank you so much that you're my Savior and my Lord. Thank you from all that is within me. In your son's name, amen.